on Plugged In, Weaponizing Trade. The world's two largest economies locked in an economic conflict over imports and exports. The U.S. accusing China of gaming the system, selling American consumers nearly $400 billion more than it buys from the U.S. But what is behind the huge trade imbalance? Will raising the price of Chinese imports by 25% even the scorecard? And what if China punches back? Who wins? Or will American farmers and consumers be the ones left holding the bag? Welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. And today, whatever happened to free trade at open markets? Well, in 2019, you are more likely to hear about trade barriers and tariffs. But what exactly is a tariff, and why are two of the world's largest economies at each other's throats? More on that from Plugged In, Steve Reddish. I happen to think that tariffs for our country are very powerful. You know, we're the piggy bank that everybody steals from, including China. President Donald China Trump believes tariffs will help even out a, a trade imbalance with China that was at its widest in 2018. China exported nearly $540 billion worth of goods to the United States. That's more than four times the $120 billion worth of American goods exported to China. After high-level trade talks failed, the U.S. began levying tariffs on Chinese products. China responded in kind. A tariff is a tax on imported goods, making them more expensive. Low wages in China allows it to produce goods at a lower cost than the United States. Adding a tariff makes the price of Chinese-made goods higher for American buyers. So the tariffs are intended to help U.S. companies compete against China's price advantage. The trade war escalated in September 2018, when President Trump targeted $200 billion worth of Chinese imports with a 10 percent tariff, threatening more if China did not capitulate. China responded by raising tariffs on $60 billion worth of U.S. products, hitting hardest America's aviation, automotive, and agricultural industries. In early May, President Trump made good on his threat, raising tariffs to 25 percent, impacting more than 5,000 Chinese products, including microscope slides, baseball mitts, refrigerators, and parachutes. China will respond by hiking its tariffs on American products to 25 percent, devastating America's soybean farmers. We have well over a billion bushels of soybeans uh, in the United States. We're selling it at far less rapidly and to in smaller volumes than we normally would this, at this point in the year. We lost anywhere from about $1.50 to $2 a bushel. Definitely been weighing in on our, our farm and our operation and what we've been able to do and what we plan to do. Last year, American soybean farmers saw sales to China cut in half from 2017 levels. 2019 does not look any better. Steve Reddish, VOA News. China is turning to another soybean producer, Argentina, to satisfy its voracious need for the plant-based protein. Meanwhile, Argentina is buying U.S. soybeans at a bargain rate to feed its own people. To discuss the state of trade relations and how it is playing out in China, we are joined on Skype from Beijing by VOA international correspondent Bill Ide. Hello, Bill, and tell me, how is this trade war with the United States viewed in Beijing? Well, since President Trump raised tariffs earlier this month on $200 billion in Chinese goods, uh, Beijing has clearly been hardening its stance. Uh, China's President Xi Jinping has called for a new long march, and there have been predictions that this could go on for years. Uh, up until earlier this month, Chinese state media re And uh, we, I've, lost, I've lost the audio of Bill Ide. We'll, we'll try to recover that. In the meantime, the hardest hit by the current trade tensions are U.S. farmers and American manufacturers. And the timing of the new tariffs and China's retaliatory actions could not be worse. As a result, farmers are planting crops under a cloud of uncertainty. Some decide to forego buying new equipment until they get a better sense of when or if this trade war will end. That's a big concern for manufacturers because many have seen plummeting sales. VOA's Midwest correspondent Kane Faribault explains. 
Their iconic blue-colored equipment is recognizable on many farms across the country. We're known for our planters and, and grain carts. Products easily spotted in large displays in front of Kinsey's manufacturing hub along Interstate 80 in Williamsburg, Iowa, where the company employs over 500 people, most of them working with one key component. Steel's uh, obviously the lifeblood of Kinsey, where our, our factory is essentially a weld house. We cut, burn, shape, form, paint steel. Steel, which now costs more. The result of a 25% tariff on the material imported from most countries. When there's a tariff on steel, it cuts right to the core of our fundamental product construction. President Donald Trump imposed the tariffs with the goal of boosting U.S. steel production and related employment. While there has been a modest benefit to the domestic steel industry, Dix says increased costs are negatively impacting companies like Kinsey. And those tariffs take their effect on, on our cost structure, on our profitability for the family, uh, through our employees and out to our dealers and on to the final customers. Those customers are mostly U.S. farmers who use Kinsey's products to plant soybean seeds. Soybean exports are now subject to retaliatory tariffs, which have sunk prices and contributed to another year of overall declining income for U.S. farmers. That means many are less likely to purchase the products Kinsey makes. The market is substantially down. We get a one-two punch. We pay more for the product that comes into us and, and therefore onto the customer. And then we have a, 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 a reciprocal situation where we can't export what was advantageous to us. Concerns Dix explained to U.S. Republican Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa, who participated in a roundtable discussion at Kinsey, along with farmers and others in Iowa impacted by tariffs. Ernst says the personal stories she gathers from these meetings go a long way in helping Trump understand the impact on her constituents. Um, he has a very different negotiating style, so he wants to start with the worst possible scenario and, and negotiate his way to a good and fair deal. Um, but again, sharing those stories is, is very important, and yes, it does have an impact. I think the president does listen. But Dick says one year under tariffs has already taken a toll on Kinsey's operations. Well, we're not really that big, so when I say that this impact has been a seven-figure impact for us in the past year, that's a substantial amount of money. An amount that so far hasn't been passed on to customers or employees. We have not actually had any direct layoffs that are attributable to this tariff situation, but we're all tightening our belts. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Williamsburg, Iowa. One man who understands the hardships farmers face is a United States Senator from the farm state of Iowa, Chuck Grassley. He himself is a farmer. Senator Grassley has been a lawmaker for nearly 60 years and has a leadership role on many of the Senate committees that impact American farmers. I spoke with the senator on Capitol Hill and asked him whether he thinks tariffs are the best way to deal with trade issues. Uh, the answer is no, because I have seen what reductions of tariffs has done throughout the world since World War II. 50% uh, of the world was in poverty. Today, less than 8% are in poverty, and uh, people are speculating that within a year or two, by the uh, rules of different uh, state uh, countries, that what's middle class, that half of the world's going to be middle class. That's quite an accomplishment in 70 years. All right, well, the tariffs, though, are hurting um, the farmers back in your home state of Iowa, and you're, in fact, you're a farmer. You're the only, I think, active farmer in the U.S. Senate. Um, what, what, what do you make of the tariffs affecting Iowa farmers? Well, I think uh, you'd have to look at it a little bit differently from China versus, uh, let's say, Mexico and Canada. Now, of course, the tariffs are off for Mexico and Canada, and the president, when the Congress passes this, will have a big victory and it'll give him a great deal of credibility. He's also been successful with South Korea. He's been successful with Japan getting beef in there. It looks like we'll have an agreement with Japan generally getting pork into Argentina. So he's had some victories, but the big... Uh, 900 pound gorilla is China and it's very difficult to predict what China's up to when they reached uh, an agreement on most everything and then in the last two weeks they backed off and we're hoping to get China back to where they were and uh, get a settlement but China doesn't have to sit down with us if they don't want to so the tariffs are there and the farmers are hurt by the tariffs but those same farmers know 
that China has been cheating for two or three decades, uh, not following the rules of trade according to the World Trade Organization. They've been a member for 20 years, they, and they just aren't living up to their obligations. While I was interviewing Senator Grassley, the president was just a few blocks away at the White House with a group of farmers announcing a $16 billion aid package for farmers. So today I'm announcing that I have directed Secretary Purdue to provide $16 billion in assistance to America's farmers and ranchers. It all comes from China. We'll be taking in, over a period of time, hundreds of billions of dollars in tariffs and charges to China. And our farmers will be greatly helped. Uh, the farmers can't do much about what the government does. If it hurts them, it hurts them. But we've stepped in with some help in, in decades over the past few years, or past few decades, and uh, we welcome it. But it isn't the ideal way to farm. The ideal way to farm is to build markets and trade and not have aid. All right. If the $16 billion is used to, to help the far American farmer, does the, does the United States use that $16 billion to purchase the farm goods? Is that what it does? Or does it just essentially give money to the farmer? Uh, mostly the latter, but a little bit of the former, because there's some ways that you, there's some part of agriculture, probably more garden-type agriculture, but I mean nuts and the big operations in California is an example, uh, buy up and then put into the government food program. But for corn, soybeans, and wheat, that isn't feasible. So then a check directly to the farmer. So what happens to the corn that they are harvesting in the soy that if, if they can't sell it to China and they're going to get compensated by the U.S. government in some form under the 16, 16 billion, what happens to that food? Well, first of all, uh, it, it, there, there's always some carryover from year to year, and there's more carryover now, not because of the tariffs, just because in the last three or four years we've had massive overproduction. So some of the downturn in prices is related to that. Uh, how much is related to the tariffs? Obviously some, particularly with soybeans, uh, but it's pretty hard to quantify. But eventually, uh, it's it, it used up. I mean, it just isn't stored for 10 years, you know. Is, is there any possibility that we would ship it off to another? Could we give a lot of humanitarian aid around the country. For instance, you know, we help out in the African continent. Any chance that any of the surplus that is not purchased because of the tariffs of the American farmers would be shipped off in humanitarian? It, 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 it will be, yes. But you got to do it for just humanitarian reasons. You just can't ship grain to some place where, anywhere you want to a subsidized product because then we're violating the rules of international trade and we would be subject uh, to fined by the World Trade Organization. How long could this tariff uh, spat or, or war with China last? Well, I hope, uh, l let me say, I hope it's what uh, our Ambassador Lighthizer has said recently that he is willing to uh, drop everything right now and go to Beijing to do more negotiations if China will come back to the position where they were just prior to the latest breakup. And if they do not, if China does not? It's difficult to predict. And in fact, President Xi was sending just the opposite signals. He went to some place in China where the long march of the communist takeover of China started in 1934, and he used those same words. We're on a long march of uh, tariff, or a long march of trade issues with America. So maybe, maybe that's just uh, trying to scare America, but that isn't going to happen. Well, we have two leaders who seem to be doing a stare down, President Trump and President Xi. They both seem pretty entrenched in their positions. That, does, that can't be good. Trump knows that we only sell to China about one fourth of what they sell to us. And if they want the United States to be a market, and it is a big market for them, they have less staying power than we do. China has been buying some of their farm products, like for instance from Argentina or from some countries in South America. Is it likely that the U.S. Um, farmers could lose their market over time? Could, could the, uh, China find a better, better source? As of now, no. But if this went on for two or three years, or maybe even shorter period of time than that, the answer to your question would be yes. What's the impact on the global economy of this between China and the United States? 
All I can say is this. I'm, I'm not really answering your question because I don't have a percentage to answer for you. But I know this. America and China, one and two in the big in the world uh, economy, it's to our benefit and their benefit to get together, but the whole world is going to benefit. And we ought to be thinking about the whole world. As we put America first, China can be second, maybe someday China will be first in the economy, but whether we're one or two, us working together is not only going to make the life of Chinese and Americans better, it's going to make the lives of a lot of people in the world a lot better. That was U.S. Senator and Farmer Senator Chuck Grassley. Let's go back to Bill Ide, our VOA correspondent in Beijing. We had a little audio problem. We've corrected it now. Bill, I was asking you what the view is in China of this uh, trade war with the United States and whether it's likely to end in the very near future. Well, what we've seen and what, what I was just uh, saying earlier is that recently, uh, since the, the new tariffs, the tariffs were raised earlier this month, that things have uh, picked up quite a bit. Uh, the tone um, in state media has changed quite a bit. Uh, there have been calls for a boycott of U U.S. Good, goods, and the Global Times has, uh, the party-backed uh, tabloid, the Global Times has called the trade dispute a people's war and a threat to all of China. Um, how much traction that those kind of calls will get remains to be seen, but clearly a discussion online about the trade war, about Huawei, is really growing. Uh, one recent post uh, that is circulating on social media shows a photograph of a restaurant with a large red banner draped across it, uh, its entrance, and it says, if you're an American tourist, you must pay an additional 25% to dine at the restaurant. Greta. And you mentioned, Bill, uh, Huawei, the dispute uh, that the United States is having over Huawei. Um, is that a sticking point? Is that, is that have greater uh, influence on this whole trade dispute for China? It clearly is a sticking point. Uh, never before have we seen the Chinese uh, government go to bat for, for any other company than it has for Huawei. Uh, some argue that this is only natural given the size of the company and that because it is a global leader in, in 5G, uh, but others say it, is ju it just confirms what many believe, that the company is really a state-backed national champion that is only a private company in name. Uh, some see Trump's the Trump administration's use of Huawei as a bargaining chip in the trade war, and there have been signs recently that China may, may have an ace of its own uh, up its sleeve, uh, and then it may play it soon. Uh, China is the world's uh, biggest supplier of rare earths, a key building block used in tech products and military hardware. If China were to cut the U.S. off, that could have an impact on a wide range of companies, from tech to defense, uh, Apple, Qualcomm, and Raytheon. Greta? Bill, thank you. Bill Eide, our VOA Beijing correspondent. Well, China is not America's only trading partner, but it happens to be the biggest. Annual trade between the two countries was more than $700 billion last year. But China buys considerably less from the U.S. Canada comes in a close second with two-way trade almost even, followed by Mexico, Japan, and Germany. But who pays for the current trade friction between the world's two largest economies? According to our next guest, it's American businesses and consumers who will ultimately bear the brunt of higher tariffs and rising prices. For a closer look at how this trade war with China is likely to impact the U.S. economy and the rest of the world, we are joined by Laura Boffman. She is president and co-founder of Trade Partnerships Worldwide, a private consulting firm that provides research and analysis of global trade policies. She's also testified numerous times before various federal agencies on the value of global trade. Nice to see you. Thank you, Greta. Before we get to the idea, before we get to the issue of whether a tariff is, is a good remedy or not, um, has, has China been cheating in its trade with the United States? Well, uh, the question is, what is cheating? Uh, since it has joined the World Trade Organization, it has undertaken commitments to live by a lot of rules of membership in that organization. And there have been some many documented instances where China has lost challenges to its, uh, whether or not it's adhering to uh, the rules it agreed to abide by in the WTO. So very definitely, yes, in many respects, it has been cheating. Uh, the U.S. has lost some cases before the WTO as well. So it's not uncommon to have uh, countries found to be violating international trade rules. Is, uh, I, I, let me ask you, are you in favor, favor generally of tariffs? 
No. Okay. Is there some other remedy to correct that other than the WTO? I mean, what is a country to do if it finds itself at an unfair trade balance um, and that it has an it has adverse effect inside a particular country here, the United States? What's the remedy? Well, we have a lot of laws on our books that help us to deal with unfair trade. We have anti-dumping and countervailing duty laws, which we have used heavily against China and pretty much uh, reduced to very small amounts U.S. imports of steel from China as a result of those laws. We have the laws on the books that help us to remedy unfairness, and we have used them effectively. Um, How, what would you fashion in this instance? Let's take, I mean, you know, some of the different, let's take soybeans, for instance. Would you use soy, what could you do about soybeans? Uh, is there unfairness in our trade? I don't know. Is there? I don't. Well, we're a huge exporter of soybeans to China. So, so not likely unfairness. What, yeah. what product would you consider to be unfair then? Uh, unfairness is such a pejorative word, you know? It's all in the eyes of the beholder. What matters is that China makes goods. Um, raw materials and components and inputs to U.S. manufacturing as well as finished consumer goods that Americans want to buy. And they want to buy at the prices China wants to sell them. That's why we are importing all of this stuff from China. Um, in addition, I think it's really important that people know that um, with respect to goods imports from China, 3% of that is American. We export stuff to China, which gets incorporated into things that China then turns around and exports back to us. So there's a whole lot of, of cross-border trade going on between the United States and China and back again that you don't see when you look at that iPhone that you bought at the Apple store right, the other give, day. Give me two visions. One is that the tariffs continue for another two years. What will we see? Mm -hmm. And number two is what would we see if we had no tariffs at all? Oh, well, if the tariffs uh, continue for another two years, we have estimated that the impact on the average American family of four could, um, from higher prices, could go up to $2,300 annually. And we could lose over 2 million U.S. jobs because U.S. manufacturers and services companies become less competitive. Um, on the other hand, as Senator Grassley has said, trade liberalization, reducing trade barriers, getting to zero. Um, has been extraordinarily helpful to the global economy and to the U.S. economy, too, and it has grown. All how, those how do you get it to zero? Um, international negotiations. That so it's, it's sitting down at the table and talking. Yeah, right. Um, has China shown any indication that it's wanted to talk about this? Um, reluctantly. Um, isn't tariffs sort of, I mean, I'm just asking because mm -hmm. to, to play the opposite view, mm -hmm. viewpoint for you, but isn't that what the whole idea of tariffs is, is to get China to come to the table and talk? It is. Uh, unfortunately, it's hurting Americans in a very significant way, as your whole program has, has demonstrated. So it's a very blunt tool. Um, it is not true that the Chinese are paying these tariffs. Um, the American importer is paying the tariffs. One of the things the president did last week is he's, he's said to, to compensate the farmers that he'll give $16 billion to, to subsidize them as they go through this period. And he gave uh, money last year, I think $12 billion last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's getting that $16 billion from tariff revenue. Mm -hmm. um, are we getting tariff revenue or anticipate tariff revenue at the amount of $16 billion so that it is a wash? Um, it, it won't be if he puts on... It, it, it isn't right now. Right now he's spending more than he's taking in, but he's getting close. He's getting close to it being a wash, yes. He will spend all of that tariff money on the farmers. What, wait, this is a discussion about China and the United States, but what about, uh, how does this impact countries like, let's say, the, the continent of Africa? How does it impact that? Oh, well, the U.S. market, what happens in the U.S. economy drives a lot of what happens globally. Um, a number of international organizations are putting out um, growth estimates for global gro growth over the next year or so, and they're all revising them downward in large part because of what's going on between the United States and China. Um, China's now buying its soybeans from Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, are we selling our, is the United States selling its soybeans to Argentina? I mean, is this, is, so we sell it to Argentina and then Argentina sells it to China or not? I, I, I don't, don't know. know. No information? Uh, no. Um, is the United States likely to lose some markets? Um, like is China, is, there's some things that China like, wants from the United States that, that they, they import from the United States. Are we likely to use that, to lose that market permanently as they go to other sources? Well, that's, that's one of the arguments that the farmers are making, uh, that they're losing uh, China as a market and other countries, Australia and Argentina, are, are filling it and that's going to be a permanent loss to them. So yes, there will be some products where China will say, no, you, United States, you're not a reliable supplier anymore. 
Does anybody win from the tariffs? I mean, we hear all the time about who's losing, but is there, you know, who, who are the big winners, if anybody, from tariffs? Well, there are U.S. producers who win, uh, those who make products that compete with the imports, and um, to some extent, they have been um, um, increasing employment. Like what? The steel industry, uh, for example, is probably the most um, obvious example. Um, were the tariffs uh, to go into effect on a whole host of U.S. consumer goods, some of that manufacturing would come back to the United States, for example, furniture. Um, so there would be some small gains. But the thing to remember is that the losses overweigh, outweigh the gains many, many fold. And your prediction is what at this point? Uh, potentially two million net job losses. Pluses and minuses, net, ne net negative two million. And do you want to predict when this is going to end this trade war? No, I don't. No chance? No. You're not going to take a chance? No, no, I don't bet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Laura Boffman, president and co-founder of Trade Partnerships Worldwide. And before we go, I want to tell you about another horrendous case of violence against a journalist, this time in Mexico, a country that is again, according to Reporters Without Borders, the deadliest nation for working journalists. The recent slaying of Francisco Romero Diaz in the city of Playa del Carmen marks the fifth time this year that a journalist has been murdered on the job in Mexico. Romero's wife said he left their house to pursue a tip on a story only to encounter two unidentified gunmen. Romero was shot twice in the head and died instantly. As dangerous as being a journalist has become in Mexico, many of the slayings dating all the way back into the 1990s have gone unpunished with no prosecutions. And since 2018, Romero had been in federal protection for his work and had two bodyguards assigned to watch him. However, authorities say he left his house without informing his guards about his whereabouts. Francisco Romero Diaz was 28 years old. We'll keep you posted on any updates to this crime and any efforts by Mexico to address this crisis. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thanks for being plugged in.